So guess what? I have repeatedly misled you because simplification is misleading and those who want to be the true masters of their own destiny must know what lies below. So it's time to learn the fascinating truth. It's time to read the fun manual. That's right, read the fun manuals. Intel's manuals available here. Volume one is a summary of life, the universe, and everything about x86. It's basically just overview type stuff. Volumes 2A through 2D explain all the various assembly instructions themselves, including all the assembly extensions. And in volumes 3A through 3D, this is where all the gory details about, you know, everything actually exists. So volume 1, summary, it's good, but you really got to get into volume 3 before you really understand how stuff works. So as a quick reminder, we are, all the volume numbers and references and everything are from the November 2019 version, which comes with this class. And we're primarily going to be looking at volume 2. Now, the correct way to interpret these pages that I'm going to be showing you is given in Intel Manual 2A sections 2.1 and 2.2. So I'm actually even going to be giving a further simplification for this next part, and I'll leave it for some optional extra material if you really, really want to dive even deeper. It's material you don't strictly need to know unless you're, you know, trying to write a disassembler or something like that. Maybe you're hand tweaking some shell code, then maybe you need to know it. Most people don't need to know, so I'll have it available, but you know, I'm not suggesting that most people need to check it out. So really, you got to RTFM to RTFM, but I'll give you the basics. So here's what I said about the AND instruction, you know, three bullet points and two examples, right? It's so simple. And here's what the Intel manual says about the AND instruction. It's a bit more complicated. So we need to learn to understand how to read that kind of table. So let's go through it one column at a time opcode column. This is going to represent the very literal bytes that you would see emitted by a compiler in order to specify a particular assembly instruction. So if you saw 24 and then you saw a single byte, that would always be the AND instruction taking that single byte, whatever it is, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, that single byte as an immediate and ANDing it into the, with the AL register. On the other hand, if you had hex 25, then you would know that instead it's going into the AX register instead of AL, and it's 16 byte immediate. Or I guess it could be a 32-bit immediate. I should, should have said 16-bit immediate there. But uh, so how do you actually know the difference between those two, right? So a CPU, when it's chugging along, reading byte after byte, trying to figure out, you know, how to decode these assembly instructions, how does it know whether or not 25 should have two bytes after it for a 16-bit value? or four bytes after it for 32-bit value? Well, the answer is that it actually depends on which mode the processor is executing right now. So if it were executing in 16-bit mode, then it would expect two bytes after 25. And if it was in 32 or 64-bit mode, it would expect four bytes after it. So each mode actually has a default operand size, and that's going to basically tell the processor what it should be expecting. Now, in reality, well, first of all, the 64-bit mode uh, default operand size is actually 32 bits rather than 64 bits. So in general, when you're reading through the manual, uh, you should expect that 64-bit will always be using the 32-bit immediates and 32-bit uh, registers unless it happens to be using some extra instruction prefix to force it to use a 64-bit value. So I talk about these instruction prefixes later, but basically it can use either of these forms. I don't want to jump ahead and talk about this column. So, all right, so then the instruction column is a basic human readable mnemonic, kind of what the assembly instruction will look like. So if these are the bytes that, you know, a CPU processor is going to see that, you know, a disassembler is chewing through, these are the interpretations that a disassembler would try to show a human when it's, you know, interpreting the, the sequence of bytes as a 24 followed by one byte or 25 followed by four bytes. So that's what the human expects. And this IMM that's representing an immediate, and you can see we've got 8-bit size, 16-bit size, 32-bit size, and so forth, well, and just 32-bit size. This column is frequently where you will see the RMX specified, so RM8, RM16, RM32. We'll see an example of that in a little bit. Okay, the operand encoding column has a little textual representation of how you would encode the various operands. So here, because it's dealing with immediate, it's an I. And so the I is basically saying that for these operands, it's always going to be AL, AX, EAX, RAX, and it's an immediate 
816 or 32 for the second operand. Personally, I don't particularly find this column super useful. Uh, you know, I mean, clearly it shows, you know, it's an RM, it's a, this, this is another way of saying RM32. It's an RM32 that the operand one is read from, operand two is read from, and then it's written back to operand one. Uh, this particular column was actually added to the manuals sometime after I first started teaching x86. So I don't particularly have any use for it, but maybe you will. All right, the 64-bit mode column specifies whether a given assembly instruction is valid in 64-bit mode. This has to do with sometimes older versions of assembly instructions get cannibalized for alternate versions, 64-bit uh, versions of things. But basically, you can just go down this column to find out whether or not it's even possible to encode this uh, when you're running in 64-bit mode. Sometimes, for instance, you know, 16-bit values will not be possible. Uh, in 64-bit mode. So this should actually say, so this is from the, the manual right here, and the V and the I should actually be valid and invalid. Uh, and you might see things like NE saying that it's not encodable, and S not supported. So this is the interpretation of this column. Basically the same interpretation, slightly less options because it's talking about the old form. So valid, invalid, and not encodable. Usually the not encodable in this column and valid in this column means this is new, some new form of the instruction that was added specifically for 64-bit mode. So obviously you can imagine that when you're running 32-bit mode, it would have had an immediate 32 and a 32-bit register. But when you're you know, running in 32-bit mode, it can't access a 64-bit register because you're basically falling back to some old compatibility mode. And back before the 64-bit extensions, they had no notion of the RAX register. Then the description column is a usually longer form of the assembly instruction. It's not going to be formatted sort of the way the assembly instruction will look just telling you what the operation is that's performed. It'll be you know, longer than inferring based on this, but it'll be much shorter than a long form human readable paragraphs of description that is given below these sort of tables. Now, if we go and look down at some of the rest of these forms of the AND instruction, we can see now these RMXs appear. The things I call an RMX, which I said the X is for, could be an RM8, could be an RM16, could be an RM32 could be an RM64. Now just taking a quick look back at the upcode thing, in the previous one we had you know, numbers like 20 and then an immediate. Now we've added in a slash R, and that slash R is gonna specify somehow a register, and that's gonna be a byte that specifies a register. So 22 and a byte to specify a register will give you the AND instruction with an RM8 and an R. Uh, but then there's also this form that has an REX and a REXW. These are the uh, things that force stuff to be 64-bit mode, and I'm not going to talk about them too much now. Again, that goes into the optional material when we really dig into this section. So as I was looking through the AND instruction to you know, just talk about it with you, I was noticing that, okay, well, I probably want to talk about the difference between, you know, there's an there's a RM8 immediate and an RM8 immediate, and you're probably going to see that and say, okay, what's the difference? What's the point? What's going on here? Uh, and the difference between those two things was just this rex byte, which I said I didn't really want to talk about, but I need to give you some sort of flavor to say, like, what's the difference here? When am I going to see this? When am I going to see that? And when I'm looking through these, I see all of a sudden, okay, well, this says and RM8 and immediate 8, and that's an RM8 and immediate 8. Okay, that makes sense. We've got and RM8 R8, so that's an 8-bit register with an 8-bit register and memory value back into register and memory value. And then this form, same thing, RM8 R8, but all of a sudden it says RM64, and it says R8 sign extended to 64 bits. So that's kind of weird. And I see another version of that for here, where instead of going register to memory, we're going potentially memory to register. So what's the deal with this? And then I said, okay, well, maybe it's a typo. Maybe it's something I don't understand about the, the assembly instructions. So let's go look at add instead. Add has a lot of the same forms as and. It's got this immediate eight and an RM8. Okay, those two basically match up. And it's got an RM8 and an immediate eight and add sign extended immediate eight to RM8. What does it mean to sign extend an eight bit value when you're interacting with another eight bit value? All right, well, that doesn't make any sense either, uh, but then these make sense. So these are just plain add RM8 
R8 to RM8, add RM8 to R8. So basically, in order to try to interpret this kind of thing, I was like, all right, well, let's just go see what a you know disassembler says about all this. So in order to do a basic test of this, I said, okay, well, I want to understand the difference between you know 20 with a register and Rex 20 with a register. Let's go disassemble that in Oda, the online disassembler, onlinedisassembler.com. We said 20 and some byte equals an and AL, and in this case, I did AL. So 20 in some byte is going to specify some sort of register 8 and an RM8. So the sum byte, I went and looked it up in a table that you know I'm going to talk about later on in the optional material. Came up with 20 and C0 is an AND AL AL. You can change that to 20 and 1. Now it's an AND of CL, sorry, AL into CL. C2 goes into DL. C3 goes into BL. And C4 goes into A high. So that's that particular interpretation, let's throw in a rex byte, which again, you know, I'll get into later, but I'm just, you know, trying to figure out what's going on here. So hex 40 is a rex byte, but the disassembler says this is actually an ink instruction and this is an and instruction. So that's because I have it set to I386, the 32-bit form of x86, so I need to set that to 64-bit form, and then all of a sudden it will turn into and al al. Okay, so 40 20 c0 is and al al, and 20 c0 is and al al. So what exactly is going on here? Well, what's really going on here is that if you have the rex byte and you get into a certain range, specifically the range. Kind of mentioned here, AH, BH, CH, and DH, these little stars that were on here were saying in 64 bit mode, the RM8 cannot be encoded to access the following byte registers if the Rex prefix is used AH, BH, CH, DH. So, what's going on here is if I use a Rex prefix and I have 20C4, which without the Rex prefix turns into AND AL AH, but with the Rex prefix, as the manual kind of warned us, we can't access AH because they've decided to reuse it for SPL, stack pointer low. That is the least significant byte of the stack pointer. So they basically hijacked four, ver four of these things for AH, BH, CH, DH. They hijacked it for SPL, BPL, SIL, and DIL. If I go past this, now all of a sudden I'm down to CL into AL again. So let's go ahead and back that up to, let's go with C0, 1, 4, 1. And now this particular thing, still again with a Rex byte, so and t 2, 0, C0 was and AL, AL. If I throw a Rex byte on there, then all of a sudden it's accessing R8B, so the, the least significant byte of R8. So you can see kind of how this Rex byte is forcing us to have access to 64-bit registers, for instance. So R8B plus 1, R9B plus 2, R10B, etc. And you would expect it would continue on through R15B. So given that the this assembler is telling me that, you know, this 20 with, you know, some Rex byte and, you know, whatever byte for whatever registers is still accessing the byte form, I am left to conclude that these are bugs, right? It, it's just the manual is wrong. It has nothing to do with an RM64. I had a Rex byte, I had 20, I had some register, and it was, you know, disassembling as, uh, you know, eight byte and eight byte, sorry, eight bit and eight bit value, right? So, you know, of course the disassembler could be wrong too, but, you know, I'm inclined to go with the sane interpretation of the manual is wrong and the disassembler is right. So you should definitely not expect it to be the case that the manual is completely free of bugs even, you know, low these many years that uh, Intel has been out. There's actually a few other bugs that were in previous versions of this class for 32-bit and so forth that I had to point out as I go. So when in doubt, test it out. So later on, if you choose to read some of the optional material about how to, for instance, emit raw bytes in your code and have them get turned into assembly, then you know you can use that for testing or you can use an online disassembler like I just did. So at the end of the day when I was talking about, you know, okay, 22 in register versus Rex 22 in register, they say they do the exact same operation. What's the difference? What's the point? The point is that this Rex byte 
is essentially just there so that you can get access to these extended 64-bit registers, SPL, BL, SIL, so forth. Because as a reminder, these SPL, BL, SIL, DI, L, these didn't actually exist in 16 or 32-bit mode. They were extensions that were added when they did the 64-bit extensions. They said, hey, for all these new registers, R8 through R15, we want to get access to them at 64, 32, 16, and 8 bits at a time. So let's go ahead and extend it so that these things can also be accessed 8 bits at a time. And so we can, you know, call this the R4 register and do R4 or R4D or R4W or R4B. Or this particular disassembler, ODA, decided to call it SPL, BP. SIL, DIL. So that's another one of those places where you can have two different names for the same register and just like we can have two different names for assembly instructions and it's up to the disassembler to decide how it wants to represent it. And just a little bit more about stuff you're going to see in the manual. There's going to be a description section, which, like I said, is going to be long form paragraphs of human readable text. There's going to be an operation section, which talks about the operation, and this is one of the simplest possible forms you can have. You know, destination and source goes is assigned into the destination, and flags affected. So here it says the overflow flag and CF flags are cleared, so always cleared by the AND instruction. The sign flag, zero flag, and parity flag are set according to the result. So you would expect that the sign flag gets set if the most significant bit is one. Zero flag is set if the result is zero. Parity flag, I haven't made the optional material yet, so I don't know whether I've told you about it or not. So I'm going to ignore that for now. Uh, and the state of the AF flag is undefined. So just reading this description quick, it says it performs a bitwise AND operation on the destination first and source second operation operands rather, and stores the results into the destination operand location. Source operand can be immediates, registers, or memory location. Destination can be register or memory location. However, two memory operands cannot be used in one instruction. So that's the thing that I told you repeatedly throughout the class. No memory to memory moves, no memory to memory ands, adds, xors, anything like that. And then it's just telling you what the AND instruction does. Each bit of the result is set to 1 if the corresponding bit of the first and second operand are 1. Otherwise, it is set to 0. It says this instruction can be used with the lock prefix to allow it to be executed atomically. Well, we don't know what the lock prefix is, but you know, I'll tell you it, it's a prefix that can allow things to be executed atomically. But we'll come back to instruction prefixes later. Lock is basically similar to rep from the rep move s. I said move s is a actual instruction unto itself and rep is a prefix, lock is another prefix. You don't see it that often, but uh, we'll come back to it and cover it when we cover instruction prefixes. And then in 64-bit mode, the instructions default operation size is 32 bits. That's what I said a little bit ago. And using the rex prefix in the form of rex r, we don't know what that is yet, permits access to additional registers. So it gets you access to you know, the 64-bit extensions using rex prefix in the form of rex w promotes operations to 64 bits. So I said it defaults to 32 bits, but there's a way to override it and force it to be 64 bit. So it would be up to the compiler to specifically know how to format these rex prefixes and to spit out the right prefix to yield an assembly instruction where the, where the processor will treat the operation as 64 bit. So there you go. I went through, you know, one example, the end example in the instruction manual. So you're all good to go now, right? I can just uh, let you loose and say, read all the assembly instructions. No, no, you want more? You got it. All right, something close enough, similar enough to and is add. So what do we got here? Like if we were to just bop into this in the manual, what would we see? We would first kind of try to look for groupings of assembly instructions. So we've got some forms here that have immediate 8 into AL, adding, got 16 into AX, 32-bit into a 32-bit register, and a 32-bit into a 64-bit register. So we could assume that this might be, you know, some bug. Maybe they meant to have immediate 64, but I'll just tell you that it's not a bug. They can only support a 32-bit immediate being added to a 64-bit register when it's encoded in this form. Now there are other forms down here that, for instance, would you know take a 64-bit register and add it to a you know 64-bit register, a memory location, whatever. So practically speaking, what this means is you're never going to do an add that is encoded with a 64-bit constant in the add instruction, but you could go off and use a move instruction to move a 64-bit constant into a 64-bit register, and then you could use something like this or this in order to add 
that register that has the 64-bit constant in it to use some other register. Okay, so grouping-wise, what do we had? We had this AL, AX, EAX, RAX, and we had the immediate sizes. And so this literally hard-coded like it must be AL, it must be AX. So that's not very nice and generic, but you can see that it's got a kind of low opcode number. So that's probably one of the original assembly instructions from W8086. Then we've got a more generic form of things, immediate eight into an arbitrarily selected RM8. So it could be any of the 8-bit registers, could be a memory location specifying 8 bits. Then we've got another one of those, it's the exact same assembly instruction, but there's a little star there with a Rex prefix. And so I'm telling you that is just in case you want to access the RM8 of the new 64-bit versions. And it's talking about sign extended here again with, you know, immediate. This is the this is the version that I actually copied and like I sliced up this thing. This is the one that like the sign extended should not be there. Okay, so if the first grouping was 81632 into hard coded registers, the second grouping looks like 81632 into specified registers. Then we've got a grouping of what looks like always 8 bits, immediate 8 bits into 1632.64, so that's going to add, and those are legitimately sign extended because it makes sense to say you're sign extending an 8-bit value and adding it to a 16-bit value, so that makes sense. 8 plus 32 makes sense, 8 plus 64 makes sense, so that would take whatever your 8-bit value is, take the most significant bit, and extend it till it's 16-bit wide, 32-bit wide, 64-bit wide, and do the add on that. Next sort of grouping we have is a R8, so these were all immediates thus far. So these are all literal hard-coded constants where those hard-coded constants are gonna be hard-coded into the actual instruction stream. Now we've got registers. Register, add a register eight to an RM8. So it could be register to register, it could be register plus memory back into memory. Same thing again with the stars, where if you wanna access the extended versions of the 8-bit registers, so we've got 81632s into 81632s, and because it's a register now, we can do a register 64 added to a RM64. And the final grouping we have here is just the flip side. So if these things ultimately can store into memory, these things can also ultimately read from memory and store into a register only. So RM8, 8, 16, 32, 64 into 8, 16, and 32s and 64s. So while these sort of instruction tables can look daunting, in reality it's just, you know, a group of, I don't know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 different groupings of assembly instructions, five little variations on the same add instruction, and just multiplied out by the number of sizes that are available. Now if we read the description from the manual, it's basically like the AND in that it just says, you know, it's going to add to this destination and the source and store it in the destination, register memory or immediate, uh, register memory, can't be to memory, so no memory to memory. But then this bit right here that I highlighted is something that I just told you kind of offhandedly when we got to the control flow section. It says the add instruction performs integer addition, okay, duh. It evaluates the result for both signed and unsigned integer operands and sets the CF and overflow flags to indicate a carry overflow in the signed or unsigned results, respectively. So basically it's saying if the carry flag is set after this, that would mean that you know when you added two things together, it was too big to fit in the register if you were operating on signed values and the overflow flag was too big to fit on the register if you were operating on unsigned values. So it sets them both. Right, based on, you know, it says it evaluates the results for both signed and unsigned operations, operands. Uh, and the SF flag indicates the sign of the signed result, right? So interpreted as if the if the end result has the most significant bit set, then it'll set the signed flag in the eFlags register. More? You want more? You've got it. Let's talk about control flow, specifically JCC, the jump if condition code is met. All right, well, here's a giant list of assembly instructions, and it only gets longer. And this is just from the very first page of the JCC in the manual. But if you look closely at the opcode column, you will notice that some things are repeated. So 74 for JE and 74 for JZ. They both just check if the zero flag is set. 77 for jump above, 77 for jump not below or equal. They both check if the carry flag equals zero and 
zero flag equals zero. So this is sort of the proof of what I said before that there's different mnemonics for the same essential instruction and it's up to the disassembler to decide which way it's going to show it. Also, if you look at the manual, you will see that there are descriptions that say jump short versus jump near. And then even for jump near, there seem to be two forms. There's a relative 16-bit displacement and a relative 32-bit displacement. But they've got this extra little comment here that says this 16-bit displacement is not supported in 64-bit mode. And it also says not supported in the 64-bit column. So the manual is actually, you know, multiplied out by, you know, so you've got two different forms of each operand. You've got then further short versus near, and you've got two forms of the near. So it's just kind of multiplying out the number of combinations of conditional control flow. So for 64-bit, it's always going to be a relative 32-bit displacement. So what does it mean? It's a signed 32-bit number. So it means it can jump 2 billion forward or 2 billion backwards. Or if it happens to be a 8-bit value, you know, 127 forwards or 128 backwards. Further down in the manual, if you look at the operations section, now you can see it's a lot more complicated than it was for the and or the add. Now all of a sudden we've got conditional, you know, pseudocode trying to explain what's going on. You know, if the condition is met, then, you know, temp EIP equals EIP plus sign extend of destination. But if the operand signed is 16, then, you know, bit mask it down so that it's just a 16-bit value. Now, clearly, EIP is not actually what's going to be used if you're in 64-bit mode. So this is, again, you know, the manual is slightly out of date, slightly inaccurate. There should probably be an if 64-bit mode thing like the jump manual page has. But perhaps they figured you get the gist of it, right? So EIP versus RIP, basic point is either way, you take the destination, you take the relative displacement, and you add it to the instruction pointer. And this little bit right here where it's talking about code segment limits, we don't know about and we're not going to learn about until the next class, but we're going to see that keep coming up in the context of control flow. More? Really? Okay. Call assembly instruction. All right, this is all the possible forms, but let's take it one half at a time. We've got a call relative 16, a call relative 32, a call RM16, RM32, RM64. Okay, so this is a call near. We just talked about short versus near a little bit ago. Short was the 8-bit form. Near was the 16 or 32. So these are 16 or 32, call near. It's a relative displacement, so it's going to be plus or minus half the bit width. They don't have the little, this is not valid in 64-bit text right here because they say it right here. This is not supported. 16-bit displacement not supported in 64-bit mode. Great, good to know. So this is the only row that you actually have to care about. And then if we read the short description, it says call near relative displacement relative to the next instruction. So basically for the math, you're not going to take the address where the call instruction is. You're going to take the address after the call instruction, and then you're going to add the 32-bit displacement, which is sign extended to 64 bits, and you're going to treat it as a signed value. So you're either going next assembly instruction plus some signed 32-bit extended value or minus some signed 32-bit extended value. All of those JCC assembly instructions that we saw were always relative displacements. But now call has another form of displacement. It can take an RM1632.64. Okay, well, neither of those are valid. So 64 bits. So for 64, it's always going to be an RM64. Call near and absolute indirect address given by RM64. So absolute indirect, absolute means it's very literally whatever number you come up with, that's the address that you're going to jump to. And it's called indirect because as an RM64, it will be specified in a register. And so there's actually some other things that have absolute addresses where it's literally like hard-coded into the assembly instruction, you know, jump to this absolute address. But here it's absolute indirect because we're indirecting through a register or you know, the RM64, meaning it could be some memory value. So, of course, that can be done in the typical RM64 form of base plus index time scale plus displacement, calculate up some address, and then call to call, meaning you know, just jump to that address and push the next assembly instructions address onto the stack. Now, the other half of the call instructions, which I sort of lopped off there a second ago, is that there is something called 
call far. So we had short, we had near, we had near relative, we had near absolute indirect. There's a call far, and that has like absolute, where it's just a hard-coded address. Call far, absolute, indirect, so some sort of indirection through something else. But basically, I want to tell you that for now, you need to ignore the call far. Uh, these depend on things called segmentation or segment selectors, and we don't know anything about those yet, but you can learn about those later on in Architecture 2001. So whenever you're digging around in the manuals after this video, you see any references to far or segment selectors or gates or call gates and things like that, we don't know about it yet, just ignore it for now. Quite frankly, it's mostly you know operating systems type people who need to deal with that. In user space, you're typically not going to see that very much. It won't be zero, there could be some operating system specific corner cases where it could appear, but for the most part, you really, your learning assembly, you really don't need to care about these for now. All right, so in the description, then there's you know a whole giant section of description, but out of all of these, it's the near call that we care about, and all the rest of this is Architecture 2001 stuff. So you can try to read the description, but it's got all of these various permutations of stuff that we don't know about yet, but which you can learn about in 2001. Furthermore, the operations section is crazy long pseudocode. It's almost 10 pages long of pseudocode talking about if this or that or that or that or that. And so it has to deal with things like, you know, the different distances of whether, you know, you're you're going 16-bit relative versus 32-bit relative. It has to do with different privilege level translations, whether or not you're going from user space to kernel space has to deal with the new control flow enforcement technology. Uh, it has to deal with the different forms of if you're in 64-bit mode, 32-bit mode, 16-bit mode. So it's a lot of stuff to chew on. More? Are you kidding me? I'm not going to do it. I think we're done. No, okay, we just got some more. Okay, return assembly instruction. Not too many forms of that. We've got a near return to the calling procedure, far return. Oh, far, we don't care about that. We don't know about that. So basically just a near return. We've got a near return with a pop additional immediate 16 bytes from the stack. So I had told you before that, you know, mostly return just takes whatever's on the top of the stack and goes back to that address, sets RIP to that address. Um, but I also said that there's a lesser seen form where you can specify a constant and that many bytes will also be, you know, added to RSP. You know, it says pop immediate bytes, but they're not popping into any registers or anything like that. They're basically just discarded. They're, you're adding to the stack pointer. And here again, control flow is hard. So if you were to look at the operations section of the manual, you can see about 10 pages here dealing with all sorts of different conditional cases of return, just like call. Wow, this guy is demanding. Okay, what else do we have? More control flow, jump assembly instruction. Jump short, jump near, jump near relative, jump near absolute indirect, jump near absolute indirect, jump near absolute indirect. Okay, so we got different size displacements for how far it's gonna jump. Relative eight, relative 16, relative 32. Oh, 16 not valid in 64-bit mode. And we've got the indirect forms where you specify some RM 1632, 64, but neither the 16 or the 32 are valid in 64-bit mode. So for all intents and purposes, there are exactly three jump instructions when you're in 16-bit mode. So we've got jump short, so RIP plus an 8-bit displacement, which is sign extended 64-bit, so it's you know plus 127 minus 128, same thing for 32-bit value. And both of those are relative displacements, which means it's hard-coded into the assembly instruction stream. And then there's the version which has a register that's specified by the compiler, so FF and some particular encoding of a register will get you an absolute indirect jump. So RM64 it, and that will calculate an address, an absolute address, where you want RIP to set to, to be set to. Only five pages of pseudocode to talk about how exactly a jump works, so it's easier than call in ret, but control flow is still hard. There's also this far displacement, but again, we don't know about that, so we're gonna skip it. More? All right, but this is the last one. C, B, W, C, W, D, E, C, D, Q, E. These are the things that I basically said, I don't see too much, I don't care too much, and I said, you don't really need to know them, but, you know, hey, we're coming back, we're reading the manual, so if I were to say, hey, go check this out and see how they work, well, you can go and see how they work, and they're actually pretty simple. 
It's basically, you know, take a single byte. These are the byte versions, convert byte to word. So these are, you know, ultimately pretty simple. Uh, they're just things like convert a byte to a word. So eight bits to 16 bits, it's just a sign extension. 16 bits to 32 bits, it's just a sign extension. 32 to 64, it's just a sign extension. And then there's these slightly different versions that look sort of more legacy-ish in that, you know, 16 to 32, but you're using, you know, the DX concatenated with AX 32 to 64, but you're doing EA, EDX concatenated with EAX and 64 to 128, but it's the concatenated form. Now you might imagine that these forms are more likely to be used if you're dealing with those things like divide instructions, right? Because the divide instruction was had some forms where it was implicitly always operating on these concatenated forms. But there's really nothing to how these things actually operate. It's just sign extend from a short value to a long value. But now you can see how you could go into the manual, you could read it, you could see you know stuff you understand, stuff you don't understand yet, like Rex, but but you could at least have a hope of understanding it because that's what this section is all about, giving you the tools that you need in order to go forth and read new things that you've never seen before and understand them. All right, so it looks like Kylo is satisfied at this point, as am I. So a little mini exercise that I have for you after this section is go to the MaldiveExample.c and change it to a signed long long instead of the unsigned long long. And you know, who doth appear? What assembly instruction pops up and why? You should go read the code and understand and you know, look up the assembly instruction if you haven't seen it before.